C-SPAN a few weeks ago. The court ruled in favor of the city, but put the case on a fast track for an appeal to the Second Circuit. The U.S. District Court for Southern New York and the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit are two of the eight federal court jurisdictions now taking part in a three-year experiment, allowing television cameras in to cover civil trials and arguments. All right, Mr. Saunders, you may proceed. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the court. My name is Paul Saunders, and I am counsel for the appellant, the Hertz Corporation. I wish to establish three propositions. First, that the Hertz Law is properly characterized as a hybrid statute, and therefore, since it authorizes or compels behavior that is prohibited by the Sherman Act, it is preempted. Second, that because of the unusual procedural posture of this appeal, this court should either enter judgment for Hertz on its Commerce Clause and Takings Clause claims, or at the very least, should remand the case for further proceedings. Third, by virtue of the comprehensive and detailed by New York State law. First, with respect to the antitrust preemption claim. The Hertz Law was enacted by the City of New York uh, for the purpose of uh, forcing Hertz to modify or rescind its January 2, 1992 price increase. On that date, Hertz uh, recognizing that it was suffering huge liability losses from rentals in the New York area, and in particular from rentals to residents of certain boroughs of New York City, raised its prices for renters uh, who lived in four of the five New York City boroughs. Regardless of where they rented the car? Uh, not entirely, Your Honor. O the rent increase applied only for rentals in the New York area. So if a Staten Island resident rented a car in the Bronx, he wouldn't pay the extra fee? He would not pay the extra fee, but a Bronx, well, uh, there are no rental, Hertz has no facilities in the Bronx. So you couldn't rent a car in the Bronx from Hertz. But if you did, if Hertz did, a Staten Island resident who rented in the Bronx would not pay a higher rate, but a Bronx resident uh, who rented in the New York area would. And th the differential was calculated by Hertz mathematically by uh, uh, determining the average uh, daily liability loss that was occasioned by rentals to residents uh, of those boroughs. Residents of the Bronx who rented uh, Hertz cars in the New York area occasioned $56 and change per day in liability losses that Hertz paid. Is, the re is one of the reasons for that uh, increase that a Bronx residence, a Bronx resident, has a right to a trial in the Bronx Supreme Court? That may be one reason, Your Honor. There, we, we don't know exactly what the reason for the difference was. There isn't any question that there is a difference we're not entirely sure why there is a difference. Uh, we do know that Bronx juries uh, uh, find for the plaintiff in personal injury cases approximately three times more often than, for example, Westchester juries do. And when they do find for the plaintiff, uh, they uh, find the, the median jury verdict is approximately three times higher than it would be for uh, Westchester residents. That may be part of the reason. We don't, we're not quite sure what the reason is. Now the Hertz Law eliminates residence-based price competition between horizontal competitors and for that reason we believe that it's preempted by the federal antitrust laws. Uh, there is today 
uh, price competition between the rental car companies based upon residents. Uh, for not only do we have this price increase that is based upon residents that the other companies did not follow, but there are also, uh, are in, for, for example, two particular clubs in, in New York, one by Avis and one by Hertz, where both Avis and Hertz offer lower prices for Manhattan residents. That kind of co price competition is eliminated by the Hertz law. That conduct, the behavior compelled by the Hertz law, if engaged in by horizontal competitor competitors voluntarily, would be a per se violation of the antitrust laws. Uh, it would be a flat, naked uh, price fixing agreement. Uh, in this case, the city has abandoned its claim that there is Parker versus Brown immunity uh, for the Hertz law, uh, I think properly so. So the core issue before this court on this, on this claim is whether or not the Hertz law is properly characterized as a hybrid law or as a purely public restraint as those words are used by the Supreme Court in particular in the Fisher case. We believe that the Hertz law is properly characterized as a hybrid law is, uh, specifically because the city of New York neither sets the price to be charged nor determines its reasonableness. And under the clear uh, Supreme Court precedent that we've cited in our brief, uh, as, as explained more clearly than I could by Professor Arita, that is the core difference between what the Supreme Court has characterized as a hybrid law and a purely public restraint. Uh, in, in all of the three cases in which the Supreme Court has struck down uh, statutes uh, uh, such as the Hertz Law, the characterization that the Supreme Court has used, that is a hybrid law, is one where the state or the municipality neither sets the rate to be charged nor determines that it's reasonable, is what characterizes and distinguishes the hybrid cases from the Fisher case that we've cited and discussed in our brief. The second proposition that I wish to assert uh, is that because of the procedural posture of this case uh, with respect to the Commerce Clause and Takings Clause arguments, this court should either enter judgment for Hertz on those claims if you believe that we are right on the law or you should remand the case for further proceedings. I say that because uh, this case uh, uh, came before Judge Knapp on, a, on our motion for a preliminary injunction. Uh, Judge Knapp said that he was going to uh, consider the city's opposition as a motion to dismiss. He then rejected some of the factual uh, evidence that we submitted to, the, to him in support of our motion for a preliminary injunction. And on the strength of that, he dismissed the Commerce Clause and the Takings Clause claims on the strength of a factual finding that he thought that he made that was different from the uh, evidence that we had submitted to uh, the district court in connection with the motion for a preliminary injunction. The city now uh, says two things. The city says first that, that uh, it took the position below that there were no issues of fact requiring a trial and there was no trial. The city didn't, didn't move for summary judgment. There was no trial. And the city also says that on this appeal, you should, in order to decide this appeal, you should assume that all of the facts pleaded and are, that are, are set forth before the court in the record are true. If that is correct, if you do that, then you must, in our view, conclude with us that the Hertz Law violates either the Commerce Clause of the United States Constitution or the Takings Clause of the Constitution because it, it requires Hertz to do uh, something that will either, it will either cause Hertz to lose money, Hertz loses about $70 million in the New York area in the three year period that we studied due to liability losses alone. It, the law will either require Hertz to continue to lose money, thus constitute a taking, or it will require Hertz to modify its pricing structure so as to discriminate against out-of-city and out-of-state residents. If we, if we charge everybody the same price, not all renters are equal. Some renters cause more losses than others. So if we charge everyone the same price, we will be discriminating against out-of-state renters. Uh, if we are required to do either one of those two things, uh, the Hertz law will violate 
either the Commerce Clause or the Takings Clause of the Constitution. What is wrong with, in effect, viewing this as an industry that's operating in the metropolitan area and the people who live here should share the cost of it? The, the, what's wrong with that, Your Honor, is that most of the renters who rent in the New York area come from out of state. Renting a car is is uh, the quintessential aspect of travel. So most of the people who rent in the New York area come from out of state. The numbers are in the record if, if you could compute them from the statistical evidence that we've shown. So that by requiring Hertz to raise its rates for everybody in the New York area, everybody who rents in New York, we, you are really requiring Hertz to cause the out of state renters, residents, to pay a disproportionately high share of the cost, of the loss, that is actually caused by the in-city residents. You are not, you are discriminating against out-of-state sta residents, and you are discriminating in favor of in-city residents who occasion a higher proportion of the losses. Is that because they get into fewer accidents or because they're more likely to sue at home rather than well, take Honor, advantage of having an accident in the Bronx? Well, there are, there are several, I, I think, different reasons why that is so. That, I mean, we, we know, for example, that residents of the Bronx who rent cars from Hertz are involved in three times more accidents than residents from Manhattan who rent from Hertz in the New York area, and eight times more accidents than renters from out of state who rent in the New York area. So that may be part of it, John. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Saunders. <laughs> Mr. Krams. May it please the court, my name is Alan Krams, and I'm appearing on behalf of the appellees. Uh, the challenged ordinance here is a valid exercise of the city's regulatory power and it should be upheld. There's no Sherman Act violation because the statute is a unilateral act by city government. In the Supreme Court's Fisher case, even though you're compelling them to do something that they can't do by themselves. What, what the Supreme Court uh, clarified in Fisher was that something does not become concerted action simply because a private company is forced to obey the law. What turns something into a hybrid restraint, and, and, and this is, comes right out of Plaintiff's Brief, actually, a quotation from Professor Arita, uh, the hybrid cases are ones in which the preempted state laws granted private actors a degree of regulatory power. In the liquor law, law cases that were discussed in Fisher, what happened was a, an elaborate price regulation scheme was set up, but the government didn't run it. The government turned it over to private industry, and private industry set the prices. Private industry enforced the price restraints. It's that delegation of governmental power that turns a unilateral government act into a hybrid restraint. But Hertz not says you have ordered them not to consider what they view as a relevant factor in setting prices. That's right. And, that and they can't compete on this basis with their competitors. That's because correct. Because of what you say. Yes, because they have Why to... Why is that any different from the Supreme Court decision? Well, what makes, what, what, what makes it different is that in the Hertz situation, in the, in, in the ordinance that we have here, the city has dictated as a matter of law that, pri that, that residents cannot be used as a basis for setting prices. It has not turned any of its authority to regulate over to private industry. It has not given them any discretion to engage in illegal activity, as in the liquor law cases where, where liquor distributors were told, you can fix prices. You have discretion to set prices. No regulatory discretion is being given to the rental car industry here. The city of New York... You say you haven't given them any discretion to engage in illegal activity. That's true. You've commanded that they engage in but, illegal activity. No, but, that, but, that's, but that's a critical difference. When, when, when you're simply acting in a non-discretionary way because you have to comply with a unilateral legislative act of government, that is not a hybrid restraint. 
That is the essence of a unilateral governmental determination. What turns something into a hybrid restraint is when government, in essence, says, well, I'm going to create this illegal price-fixing scheme, but I'm going to let you, private industry, run that scheme. I'm going to let you make all the discretionary decisions. That's why the liquor law cases that were discussed in Fisher were considered Sherman Act violations, because the liquor industry was given control. Here, the rental car industry hasn't been given control. They've been given a legislative command, and they've been told that they have to comply with it. And the Fisher case directly makes it clear that the fact that a that, that uh, uh, private industry has to comply with the law does not make something hybrid. It's, it still remains a unilateral act of the government. So the Sherman Act claim uh, simply is not applicable here. Nor, nor is there any basis to uh, Plaintiff's Commerce Clause claim. Uh, we have a situation where the City Council has even-handedly said you can't use residence-based pricing. If tomorrow Hertz or Avis or some other rental car company were to decide that residents of, say, Newark, New Jersey pose too great a risk and they wanted to surcharge them, the New York City law would protect them in New York City, too. Similarly, if the rental car company is an in-state company versus a multinational company like Hertz, the prohibition applies equally. When, when a legislative body imposes a regulation that uh, leads, as Hertz alleges this will do, to some increased costs, it is not a commerce clause violation if interstate commerce bears some share of that cost as long as the costs are borne equally in state and out of state. And that's exactly what happens here. If Hertz has to increase its rates as it says it might have to do, people who live in New York City are going to pay that increase. People who live elsewhere in New York State are going to pay that increase just as people who live in New Jersey or anywhere else are going to pay. And, and, and because of that non-discriminatory approach, there simply is no Commerce Clause claim here. With respect to the contract clause, I assume you have conceded that in the transitional period there would be a contract clause violation if it were to be applied to the outstanding contracts that hadn't yet been paid. Well, what we're saying is that the city would not read the city would not read the law that way, and the city would not enforce the law against any existing any contract that that was uh, made before the law takes effect. Uh, we're not suggesting, as Hertz did in its brief, that they should be granted judgment on that claim. There simply is no case in controversy before this court on the contract issue because the city has said it wouldn't apply it. If somewhere down the road somebody is going to come in with a Hertz contract and argue otherwise that their surcharge is impermissible, then I think the courts can deal with that when that other party comes in and there's a live case in front of them. How about the state preemption argument? All right, Armstead, there's no basis for the state preemption argument here. What, what, what Hertz is, is, is arguing is that there is a detailed, comprehensive state legislative scheme from which one has to imply state preemption. It's not clearly expressed, and they're not saying that the New York City ordinance is inconsistent with any state law. When you claim implied preemption, the Court of Appeals, the New York State Court of Appeals, has made it clear that that, that preemption must be unmistakable. And it comes from, it comes from a, a, a legislative scheme at the state that is so sweeping that, in essence, it would leave no doubt that the state intended to preclude local government from, from doing any legislative activity in the area. When you look at the, at the New York State Court of Appeals cases, where state preemption was found, you will see legislative schemes that are far more detailed than the statute that's at issue here. Here, the state legislation is a provision of the general business law that uh, regulates certain aspects of the rental car relationship. It does not regulate the price aspect at all, other than that it does require full disclosure of prices and advertising and the like. It, it, it deals mostly with the liability of renters if, if a vehicle is damaged and the kind of circumstances in which they would be liable and the limitations on that liability. But it's quite clear from that statute that the state was not taking over regulation of the rental car industry and, uh, and this court should reject the preemption claim. If it is necessary for us to get to the state preemption claim, what is your position with respect to the suggestion that 
this is something that's more appropriate for the state court of appeals to decide and we should give them that opportunity but we feel that the state law on this is so clear that it is unnecessary uh, to certify the question to, to the uh, Albany to the Court of Appeals in Albany even However, we can of course, tell what if, state law is excuse me even we can tell what state well, in this in this particular instance we believe that to be the case but of course what's 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 more important here is what uh, the court thinks and if, if the court in fact has any reservations on the subject then we believe in fact that the, the appropriate thing for the court to do would be to certify certify the question to Albany. Uh, in short, there, in short what, what, what happened here is, is uh, the New York City Council was faced with a business practice that it found to be inappropriate for sound economic and social reasons. Uh, they found it divisive uh, within New York City. They found it imposed economic hardships on those boroughs of the city that have the highest proportion of poor and minority residents. And, and, and this was a, a legitimate legislative determination from the city council that the proper thing to do would be to take these liability losses that Hertz is claiming and spread them over a larger population. And because the city council did that in an even-handed, non-discriminatory way that will apply to New Yorkers and non-New Yorkers alike, it was a valid legislative enactment and the uh, judgment of the district court should be affirmed. There is a state action pending involving this regulation, isn't there? Yes, there is. Are some of the questions common? Some of the, well, the questions are not common in the sense that the New York City ordinance is not before the state court. Uh, in, in the state court action, uh, the Attorney General and the City of New York are claiming that various New York State civil rights laws are violated by the Hertz pricing structure and also that this general business law provision is violated by the state pricing by, by, by Hertz's pricing structure. But the, the city ordinance is not before that court and was not enacted at the time that suit was begun. Now, what's happening in that case? I believe there's a pending motion for summary judgment that has not yet been decided. All right, thank you, Mr. Krams. Mr. Saunders, you're reserved some rebuttal time. May I address first, uh, Your Honor, the question uh, put uh, by Judge McLaughlin first about the, uh, the pending state claim. There is a case pending in the New York State Supreme Court, and there are common issues. Um, and to answer Judge Feinberg's question in a little bit more detail, we did move for summary judgment almost immediately after that case was brought and the city uh, and the state have requested adjournments and have not even have not yet responded to that motion for summary judgment. The common issues are these, Your Honor. The uh, uh, first of all, uh, there is a, a a defense raised in our motion for summary judgment that uh, that uh, if the New York State law, which prohibits rental car surcharges, uh, that is charges in addition to the basic rental rate and certain insurance charges, which the state contends that the Hertz price increase was, if that was applied the way the state tries to apply it, then uh, uh, that would implicate the Commerce Clause and the Takings Clause of the Constitution. So, so the very same argument is made in the state case. The other common issue, of course, is um, whether or not, the, or the, 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 the other aspect in which the state case is of interest is that what the state is charging in the state case is that the Hertz rate increase constituted a prohibited surcharge. We say in this case that that is strong evidence of the fact that the state scheme of regulation of rental cars was detailed and comprehensive. In fact, it was so detailed and so comprehensive that the state was able to claim in that case that the rate increase constituted a violation of the state law. That's further evidence of how detailed and comprehensive the state regulatory scheme is. Without going into all the details, I would simply note with respect to that that we have set forth the entire regulatory scheme in the appendix to our main brief, and it, and it fills eight pages of single-spaced text. That's how detailed and comprehensive the state scheme is. With respect to the antitrust claim, as, as your honors know, 
there are, there are not very many, but there are a few key Supreme Court cases, the first of which was the Schwegman case, the second of which was the Midcal case, and the thir third of which was the Fisher case, and the fourth of which was the 324 Liquor case. Three of those cases held that state laws were preempted. One of those cases held that a city ordinance, the Fisher case, was not preempted. Uh, counsel for the city cites Professor Arita for the proposition that what is at issue, what the city has done here is to enact a unilateral statute that is not a hybrid statute. If we're going to quote Professor Arita, we ought, I think, to quote the rest of Professor Arita. What Professor Arita said, I'm quoting from his 1990 supplement, was that the vice of the state regime in Mid-Cal, which is one of the cases in which the Supreme Court did strike down a, a state statute as preempted by the Sherman Act, was that, the, that California has no direct control over wine prices and it does not review the reasonableness of the prices set by the wine dealers. By contrast, the presence of genuine public control over rental prices is what saved the Berkeley Ordinance in the Fisher case from preemption. That is precisely the point. The difference between the Midcal and the Schweigman cases on the one hand and the Fisher case on the other hand is that in the Fisher case, the city of Berkeley set the price and supervised it. And your honors will see that that is essentially the same kind of analysis that is applied to determine Parker against Brown immunity. And as, as Professor Rita says, the two tests are essentially two different sides of the same coin. Uh, even though the city doesn't claim Parker gets Brown immunity, the analysis is essentially the same. So the, the city statute clearly is a hybrid statute because the city doesn't set the price and doesn't determine that the price is reasonable. The city statute simply eliminates one aspect of price competition. The clearest, the clearest example of what I'm talking about, Your Honors, is the Miller against Headland case from the Ninth Circuit, which followed the 324 liquor case. So that is the most recent uh, uh, circuit court, court case. In the Miller against Headland case, the court said, J Judge Stevens said, from the Ninth Circuit, a comparison of Schweigman and Midcal with this case, Oregon statute, leads to the conclusion that the Oregon regulations constitute a hybrid restraint in violation of the Sherman Act. The argument, similar to the city's argument here, that the regulations merely involve unilateral action must be rejected on two grounds. First, Schwegman demonstrates that a showing of concerted activity among the Oregon wholesalers is not necessary to establish an antitrust violation. The mere fact that each wholesaler complies unilaterally with the regulations does not save an impermissible pricing scheme from an antitrust challenge. In Schwegman, which was the first of the Supreme Court cases, Non-contracting retailers were compelled to comply unilaterally with a state-authorized pricing scheme. May I finish the quotation, Your Honor? Yes. But the absence of concerted activity among the retailers was not a bar to a finding of a Sherman Act violation. Second, Schwegman and Midcal show that the Oregon's actions are not unilateral. The regulations constitute a hybrid restraint because in those two cases, Oregon allows private parties to set the prices and does not review the reasonableness of those prices. It follows that this case is unlike the purely public restraint of Berkeley's, as the Fisher case, regulatory scheme which removed the power to set rents from the landlords. Thank you very right, much. Thank you, Mr. Saunders. We'll reserve decision. The last case is on submission. This is C-SPAN coverage of arguments in the case of the Hertz Rental Car Company versus the City of New York, made before the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. In arguments seen several weeks ago on C-SPAN, a lower court upheld an ordinance prohibiting companies from charging different rates in various parts of the city. At the first of the year, Hertz began charging more in some parts of New York where the losses were the heaviest. After the city passed the ordinance, it was challenged in federal court by the car rental company. If you would like more information, you can write to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit 
at the Foley Square Courthouse. In New York City, the zip code there is 10007. Next, from the U.S. District for Southern New York, it's an interview with Judge Miriam Goldman Cedarbaum. This district court is one of the eight jurisdictions taking part in a three-year experiment, allowing cameras into federal courts. During the experiment, C-SPAN will bring you arguments before these federal courts and interviews with some of the judges about their jobs. Judge Cedarbaum came to the federal bench in 1986.